Hello, everybody, and welcome to the California Small Farm Conference. Uh, thanks for being with us here today on day two of this big event. Um, we are about to kick off local food for people in need, introducing farms together. Um, so it's a really exciting new initiative to provide some economic opportunity for our small local farms, as well as uh, get food to the people who need it most. So I, it's my pleasure to introduce today's panel. So um, Hector, are you, uh, do you want to, are you introducing or who's, who's introducing? Uh, I can introduce. Um, All right. Terrific. <laughs> thank you so much. Yep. And hello, everybody. Welcome. My name is Hector Ryder. I'm Cavs Farm to Market Program Co-Director, and I'm joined by Ben Thomas. Sorry, my dog wants to play right now. By Ben Thomas, founder of Shared Plate Strategies, and the Love Fresh Approaches Food Access Program Director. And joining us for the question portion of the presentation, we have Wilkin Louie, from California Association of Food Banks. Uh, apart from that, we're also sharing with you guys a couple of polls to let us know more about where you're coming from here in the state of California and what do you do? Are you a farm? Are you a nonprofit? Do you work for a nonprofit? Are you, do you provide technical assistance or maybe you work with the government? Let us know, we wanna find out. Uh, and yeah, so why don't we begin with the presentation? Thank you so much, Ben. And well, first of all, if we go to the second slide so that I can talk about because I did this presentation before we even had any sort of present the, the introduction before we had the presentation, but let's talk. Firstly, I want to thank everybody for taking the time to join us today. Today, we'll be talking about the Local Food Purchasing Assistance Program in California, specifically about the Farms Together program. We will be sharing a brief history of the program and then about the specific ways we hope to implement the project. Lastly, we'll open up the floor for questions. As a point of reference, we believe this presentation will provide a strong knowledge base for anybody who has been following the LFPA program, but in particular, it will be of most interest to potential vendor organization, the food hubs and aggregators of the group. These are groups who aggregate and distribute local food and will be eligible to participate in this model. Well, without further ado, I'll pass the mic to Andy. Um, thanks, Hector and CAF at large for hosting this conference and me. Um, it is good to see a lot of names I recognize um, attending and those I don't. Um, but I am Andy Olive, the Food Access Program Director um, at Fresh Approach. Uh, we don't have a lot of time today, um, so I'm going to briefly overview the background of this project, the Local Food Purchasing Assistance Project, and then um, pass it off um, to Ben to spend some time getting into the weeds. Um, so the local food purchasing assistance program came out of the farmers to families food box program in 2020. Uh, for some of you here who participated in that project and others who followed along, you know that program was filled uh, with a lot of bad politics and poor execution um, that was very harmful and prohibitive both to small local farmers um, and food insecure nutrition insecure families. That being said, um, in the version um, that Fresh Approach ran and others like us did, um, there was a lot of innovation and opportunity that this federal funding created uh, in transforming how hunger relief works in the United States uh, and how small local food systems can participate in that system. Following the end of Farmers to Families uh, and the changing administration, the USDA led what I think was uh, actually a very engaged listening effort. Groups like ourselves and others around the country advocated for the continuation of the program with new rules that actually prioritize small food systems and farmers of color in particular. I honestly give a lot of credit to the USDA, if there's any USDA people here today, um, for how they took what they heard and revamped the project under the new title LFPA, Local Food Purchasing Assistance Program. The LFPA was announced last spring um, by the USDA um, and around the country it is more than, I think at this point, $800 million um, to distribute local food to food and secure populations. Um, different from farmers to families, individual organizations do not apply directly to the USDA. Rather, each state and federally recognized tribe can submit a single application um, from just one, one agency. Each state then has a lot of discretion in how the project is run, as long as it is fulfilling certain expectations um, from the USDA. The biggest expectation being that the project supports small and diversely owned farms. So the funding was distributed around the country based on population. Um, because of that, we're very excited to say California received the largest pot of funding, um, which is an amazing opportunity. 
the state agency in charge in California, the state agency that applied to the USDA is the California Department of Social Services. Um, and through 2025, um, the amount of funding available across the state of California is gonna be around 80 to 90 million. I actually don't know the final numbers. Um, in CDSS's application to the USDA, they broke up the funding in three ways. In the first way, CDSS is going to distribute the funds directly to individual food banks to purchase from local farms. In the second way, representing the largest pot of funding, um, the money will be issued to Fresh Approach, CAF, and the California Association of Food Banks as project administrators to redistribute amongst food aggregators who will deliver food to food banks under what we're calling the Farms Together program, and we're talking about today. And lastly, there's another pot of funding um, that I think is going to be around 12 to 13 million um, that is allocated to CDFA by CDSS. Um, and CDFA, in turn, is going to contract with Farms Together uh, to redistribute those funds as well. Um, the difference between that with that funding is that there will be no restrictions uh, on where the food must go. Uh, so it could go to a food bank, um, like the other parts of this project, but could, uh, it could also go to another community partner organization um, who is distributing uh, food resources to the community. Um, in the next part of the presentation, uh, we're going to go into the weeds of the project, how it really looks um, on the ground. Um, but what is important to know is that both CDFA and CDSS have been very hands off on the rule setting of the project, um, aside from those main deliverables of supporting BIPOC growers and distributing the food primarily to food banks. Within those objectives, our three organizations have a lot of discretion in building the program um, to meet those needs. So what we're presenting to you all today is what we hope will be an ongoing and potentially changing um, project um, that we come to understand um, and modify and improve over time. Um, but before we talk about the program, however, I want to pause and talk about our intentions. Um, we very much recognize been a project that represents a lot of funding uh, and also has the stated goal of diversity, equity, and inclusion. How we set up rules is a very complicated and important process. As three organizations um, with white leadership, we are very sensitive to the dangers uh, we face in perpetuating systems that harm farmers of color and continue to perpetuate racism in the food system. Uh, what, is, what is very important, I think, to know about this meeting um, and this process in general is that we very much are striving to be transparent in our decision making uh, and responsive to the input of our growers and aggregators um, and stakeholders of color in the food system. Uh, what we are presenting today is, is not the fun, final product, it's our starting point. Um, it is our best effort at designing a program that can fulfill the goals of the project uh, within a pretty aggressive timeline for execution. Um, but our hope is to make this program as successful as possible and advocate for its permanent funding um, from the USDA or other government agencies. And to do that, we know um, we need to be responsive um, to you all in making the program as successful and accessible um, to everyone. Um, so with that said, we can go into the weeds, which are very fun. And Ben will do that. So I'll pass to Ben. Thanks, Andy. Um, so the, I'm Ben Thomas, I'm with uh, Shared Plate Strategies, but happy to be here as the farm to market strategist for the Community Alliance with Family Farmers. Um, the, the project that I'll lay out right now comes from a place of experience of each of our, the experience that each of our organizations has running similar projects, as well as from input gathered from individuals and farms and aggregators and other partners already. Um, that being said, we very much believe it's a process and our goal is not just to engage you on a one-time basis in this context of a conference and our Q&A, um, but also open the door for ongoing communication, coalition building, and co-development. The following program design was built with an intention of spreading the funding to as many farms as possible, um, as many informal and formal aggregators as possible, um, and with an eye towards supporting the food system's network capacity and use this opportunity to become more interconnected, resilient, and mutually supportive. Uh, the reason that we've branded Farms Together instead of just the California LFPA project is because we want this to continue beyond the funding of LFPA and be a long-term resiliency uh, program to support food access through supporting small to mid-scale farms and, and local food systems. Um, so that brings me to the program itself. Like I said, a lot of discretion was given to organizations to set the rules, um, and at the very simplest explanation, the project looks like this. 
It's a participating aggregating organization that we're calling vendors. We'll source fruits and vegetables from multiple farms. We'll pack that food into boxes or prepare it for bulk delivery. So like a farm box or bulk delivery, and then deliver that food directly to a food bank or community-based organization. Um, the vendors will pay the farms directly and our organizations will reimburse the vendor. That also goes through these, these four on the list here. Um, though that is more or less a simple program, um, we're left with the challenge of the challenges of how do you ensure that the purchasing significantly benefits uh, small scale BIPOC growers? And how do we include, make sure and support small scale BIPOC growers to the program? Um, and so we've developed a set of strategies that we believe will ensure this outcome. The first strategy to this goal is that we have designed an RFP process or request for proposals process, um, also called bid solicitations, that prioritizes organizations that aggregate food for multiple farms. So in this way, we're able to spread the funding to as many farms as possible. Um, were we to contract instead with single farms, we would have a much harder time reaching as many growers. So we're trying to create you know, a, a fair playing field throughout this experience as well. The second strategy is that we've removed two historic barriers to participation in programs like this. Um, one is lowest price bidding, and the other is prohibitive food safety requirements like third party good agricultural practices certifications. Um, you might have recognized those from the USDA program that took place last year. Um, so in our program, we don't, we will have a values based bid. So everybody has to fit within the same budget, but it's based on who can provide the best service meeting the values of the program. Um, and then uh, meeting food safety requirements that also align with FISMA, but don't require that third party certification. And we'll go more into that. Um, the second strategy is we've removed um, two historic barriers to participation in programs like this. I'm sorry, I reread my last line. Uh, the third strategy, we've set eligibility requirements. So what we saw in the um, uh, previous program was with no eligibility requirements, a lot of companies got contracts who didn't even work with food normally. Um, and beyond that, the greatest portion of contracts went to large multi-state distributors, um, not supporting what we consider to be the local food systems that we're talking about today. So uh, eligible organizations for this project include individual farms, preference for those who are aggregating with others, food hubs under a certain annual sales volume, and nonprofit organizations. Um, and then the last strategy is that we set a competitive bidding process where the contract awards do not go to lowest price bid, like I mentioned before, but instead applications are evaluated by the diversity of their supply chains. Um, so next we'll, we'll speak about the specific process of that vendor application. Um, to implement these strategies, we designed a two-stage application process involving two applications. And we'll, I'll, with that, I'll pass it back to Andy. Um, thanks, Ben. So the first application is just an eligibility check. Um, when you submit an application, uh, or when a potential vendor submits an application, our team reviews the materials in the application to determine where, whether we have any concerns that your organization um, would not be able to fulfill the deliverables of a contract. And again, those deliverables are basically sourcing food, packing it, and delivering it. Um, this application would only need to be submitted once, um, and once approved, you are an enrolled network member eligible to bid on individual contracts uh, when they become available. Um, and a contract looks like an attachment to a certain amount of food, an amount of funding, and a specific food bank. Um, one crucial note for this part of the process is that it will require information about your organization's ability to ensure food safety. We know that a big barrier of entry to the Farmers to Families Food Box program was GAP certification, and we want to be very clear that GAP is not required to be part of the Farms Together program. However, it is still very important that we build a system that ensures food is handled properly um, with strong traceability and so that uh, no one is getting sick. <laughs> so I will pass to Hector um, to talk a little bit more in detail about the food safety. Thank you very much, Andy. And yes, as Andy mentioned, we will not require any third-party certifications. 
However, we would require some sort of food safety plan. The main requirement are a simple food safety plan for farms and an understanding of a food hub's PC or preventative control rule status. The preventative control are the steps that an aggregator entity takes to avoid any health hazards when they deliver, pack, or process the food in question. In the case of applicants who don't have any food safety strategies in place or have concerns raised by our team, we will reach out directly to participants to inquire more and assist with the process. Once a food safety plan has been established, will then be the, will then be the applicant able to participate in the process. <laughs> Again, sorry. The vendor approval application will remain open throughout the duration of the program. Therefore, a denied application does not mean a food hub or farmer lost his chance to participate. They can reapply at a later date when all the requirements are met. As part of the program's resources, we will provide food safety information, workshops, and videos to assist food hubs and farmers struggling with food safety. We know it's a complex topic that can't be completely covered in this presentation. Therefore, we encourage you to go through the program description once we publish it to get a more accurate picture of the requirements. It is worth noting that animal proteins will not be considered in this process. Any food bank that is interested in animal protein will reach out to the vendors directly with their own systems and requirements outside of the Farms Together program. And yes, I hope that helps answer some of the food question concerns that we have. Uh, I know that there'll be a lot of more questions, but uh, let's continue powering through. And yes, I give the, the, the stage back to you, Andy. Thanks for the stage back. Um, following the approval stage, um, once you've shown us you have um, food safety in place, you we review and think that you can uh, implement the project. The next step is the actual application for a specific contract. So this is the competitive bid where any approved vendor can apply. What they'd be applying for is a contract to deliver food to either a food bank or a community-based organization. So what they'd be seeing is the specific amount of funding um, and the specific food bank um, with a little bit more detail about um, you know, when the delivery should happen, whether the food should be delivered in bulk or in boxes, um, just more granular detail about what they'd be bidding for. It is in this part of the process, this part of the application, where we've baked into the system um, a way to evaluate bids based on diversity, equity, and inclusion principles. Um, the main information we will be referencing um, to do so, to evaluate, is within the application, we'll be requesting uh, from the vendor their a proposed list of their farmer supply chain. Um, you will submit the specific list of farms you plan to source from in this project, and we ask that you include demographic information about those farms. Um, we've designed a grading uh, score criteria system that includes race and ethnicity as a value, but also other diversity criteria we know to be important in building a strong food system, um, of which Ben will talk about. Thanks. Um, and so <clears throat> we under, and thanks for your patience, everybody. I, I uh, got lost on my slide there for a second, but I think we're back on track. Um, we understand that a healthy and diverse food system places value on a lot of different factors. Um, though this project specifically places priority sourcing for BIPOC growers, um, there are other factors that also influence decision-making and assigning contracts. So the main criteria we'll be looking at are locally, our locality, um, exactly how close the farms are uh, that will be sourced from, the sourcing from USDA defines socially disadvantaged farms. This includes majority owned farms by women and people of color, um, veterans, et cetera. Um, in addition to this category, we recognize the particular impact of racism in the minimal representation in California of black and American Indian farmers. So accordingly, if a vendor supply chain supports these groups, they'll receive more point allotment. Additionally, we'll be looking at how many farms qualify as beginning farms and how many are very small scale as measured by annual sales volume. Um, we're also going to be looking at, uh, especially in the first initial phase, the breakdown of organic farms that are uh, being utilized and how that can influence the program moving forward or you know, how it affects the, the program. Um, Lastly, we have some criteria that will be influenced by the needs of the food banks to serve their specific populations. We want vendors who can provide the foods that the food banks would like to utilize. Um, before I go on to the other categories, there's an important note about the categories of locality and diversity. 
Um, in both of these cases, we recognize that there is both value to a vendor supporting a greater number of farms, as well as vendors supporting fewer farms, but a greater portion of those farms are from very nearby or are BIPOC owned, for example. Um, to accommodate both of those values, there are points avail available based both on volume and percentage ratio. We came up with this grading criteria through our own experience and through conversations with food systems partners. Um, however, we think this model is unique um, and there wasn't uh, a lot of precedent to follow that. It was picking from a lot of other similar types of value-based bidding systems. One note about the application. Both the vendor and solicitation applications will be available in Spanish, and you will see when you review them that the applications rely mostly on yes and no questions. Uh, we made this decision intentionally to make the application process easier and accessible, but we very much welcome your opinions about how challenging the application seems. Um, we suspect the most challenging component will be collecting the demographic details for your supply. However, we believe that it's a crucial requirement so that we can keep organizations accountable to the mission and the intent. As mentioned above, uh, the most, and you can see here in this slide, um, the most significant amount of funding is dedicated to delivering food that must arrive at food banks. Um, this is an image of all of the food banks that will, will be participating in the Farms Together program. So not every, uh, not every farm, no, I'm sorry, not every food bank in California is participating in Farms Together. Some are also receiving allocations separately of, through the LFPA program. In either of the, these cases, through the, the two different ways that we are allocating funding, food banks can receive that funding. So if you're working with a food bank or live near a food bank, you can ask them whether they're participating in the Farms Together program or independently, and that'll affect the different um, pathway that you take to be able to, to work with them. That's also similar to the independent food bank where you can work with a community-based organization that's not, not a food bank. Um, we do have an amount of, uh, as, as you know, to go along with that, we have an amount of funding uh, allocated from the CDFA that is eligible to go to vendors who may already be working with non-food bank community partners. Uh, we know there's a lot of, especially post-COVID as well as before, or um, post the beginning of COVID or, or before, we know that many of you are already supporting great organizations doing community food security work and want to tap into this funding to continue that work. Um, the programmatic processes will be identical, but you'll see in the solicitation application that you'll be required to enter information about your proposed distribution partner to get that food to the people who need it, um, rather than just to a food bank who is already working with, a uh, food bank that's part of the program that's already, already uh, distributing that food. In terms of allocation amounts, we don't have that finalized, uh, but we can say broadly that the funding amounts are allocated based on population centers. So the food banks in more populous areas like Southern California and the Bay Area will have more funding. Um, and with that, I'll pass it back to Hector. Thank you so much, Ben. And I'd also like to mention that in the map that you're looking at, the light orange, orange and green counties are the ones that are participating in the Farms Together program. So we're talking about the majority of the ones in the state. We're working with 39 uh, food banks across California. But let's start the beginning of the end of this, of this presentation. Let's talk about contract awards and length of those contracts. And lastly, about data collection. So in full transparency, we still do not have the contract sizes and lengths finalists. We're workshop workshopping it together with the food banks and the participating ag uh, aggregators. Very roughly, we believe contract lengths will be a minimum of six months and the contract sizes will vary from 50K to 500K. The overall size of the contracts will be determined by the allocation set by CDSS to each participating food bank. One important note though, even though we have a competitive grading system in the case of larger markets, our goal is to split the funding up in a way that allows as many contracts as possible. We want to distribute contracts to as many groups as possible, not allowing simultaneous contracts until all interested vendors in a region can hold one. In terms of pricing, there are three different delivery options available in this program. A vendor can pack aggregated products into pre-assembled CSI style boxes. They can deliver bulk produce to food banks and community partners directly, or a combination of the two. This will be selected by the preference of those food banks and community food distributors. 
For CSA style boxes, we expect at least five different products per box and have set a reimbursement rate of $36 per box to the vendor. Though we know it is not an exact science, we have estimated that 850 of those 36 should be allocated for overhead costs to your organization and the remaining 2750 should go to food costs. For bulk deliveries, it will work a little bit differently. A vendor will be given a do not exceed contract amount and the food bank will likely order directly from an availability list and drag down from that number over the contract length. Following the successful bid, the project begins. You will sign a purchase order agreement with California Association of Food Banks. You will be, you will be introduced to your partner food bank, deliverables and expectations will be set and food will be out the door. As you can imagine from a project like this one, there will be a data collection piece. Thankfully, by filling out the farmer list in your applications, much of the data is already collected. However, some more information will be required. We haven't finalized, finalized this, but it should be very straightforward. At the minimum, you should expect to provide delivery receipts and proof of payment receipts to the farmers. This will both capture the impact of the program as well as hold the vendors accountable to farmers and communities receiving the food. In regards to data privacy, we know that we are collecting a lot of sensitive, sensitive information about the farms. We're awaiting a list of what data points will be required by CDFA and CDSS, but we, be it, but we are committed to staying transparent about where the data is going outside of our three organizations and advocating to CDSS and CDFA that any farm level data only be shared to them anon anonymously. Oh my God, a bit of a tongue twister for me at the end. But anyway, okay, this has been a lot of information. We, I think we powered through it fairly quickly and we still have somewhat about 15 minutes left. So why don't we open up the floor for questions that we hope, I see already some in the chat and some in the Q and A, uh, in the Q &A, Q and a part, sorry, tongue twister there for me as well. A lot of coffee today, but anyway, thank you. And yes, questions. Um, thanks, Hector. I am going to cover one question that I've seen come up in a couple of different places. Um, so one, uh, I suspect there's a lot of individual farms here, and I know we spoke a lot about aggregation and vendors. Um, so I have the sense that people are, farmers here are trying to understand how they can um, tap into this. Um, so I want to maybe speak to a couple points. Um, I think, you know, strategically, our goal here is to spread this to as many farms as possible. And that's why we have the focus on aggregation um, sites. But we really believe the opportunity here, it being, uh, you know, $80 million is very real for small farms who might want to become aggregators themselves. Um, if they are in a small farming community, we think this is a really great way to try to explore that avenue for growth of your business. Um, and to support other farmers nearby. So that is one way that a farm can, well, any farm can apply no matter what, they will be more competitive um, if they are sourcing from other farms. So we think this is a real interesting launching point um, to strengthen our food system um, by directing resources to aggregation sites. Um, the other note on that, um, if it doesn't make sense for you to aggregate, if this application is a little bit exclusionary, we will be making public and available the vendors um, once they become onboarded um, publicly um, so that you can identify the vendors in your region um, and reach out to them directly um, to explore uh, sourcing into their supply chain um, as part of this project. I mean, we and know- just, Oh, sorry. And I was just gonna add to that, that if, if any farmers wanna reach out to us to connect with aggregators that we know of in your area in the meantime, we're happy to try to get that going as well. Yes. Um, and I Sorry, think, please go ahead. No, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, broadly, we are very, all of us are very available and we'll put in the chat uh, the email to reach out to us to, to find out more um, and solicit more input. We still actually don't have a start date um, for this project, but we're hoping it'll be the mid spring of this year um, and continue through 2025. Um, so our hope long term is to get as many people are interested um, and onboarded into this project as possible. Um, yes, so are there other questions in the chat we should answer? Um, clarifying note for the maybe confusing colors of the map, the blue counties, uh, what that indicates is that the, far, the food banks in those counties are contracting individually with CDSS. So those counties are participating, um, but not through the farm. Those food banks are participating, but not through the Farms Together program. 
Um, but if you are in those regions, it's worthwhile to reach out to the individual food banks in those counties um, to see what their strategies are for sourcing. They will be still having to fulfill the requirement of sourcing diversely. We just don't exactly, we're not in charge of how they do that. Let's see. What else are good questions? From Layla, from Layla Aguilar, are, are already existing mutual aid collaborations eligible for this funding? No food banks are involved, but a nonprofit and independent women-owned farms. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, in, in that case, you would develop, so essentially you'll see uh, uh, when you get to the solicitation stage, you see two different pathways. One is that you bid on solicitations that food, we've put out on behalf of food banks based on what they need. And the second is that you can uh, create your own bid with along with a distribution partner. So you would be a nonprofit coordinating farms with a distribution partner bidding on that on that side. So you 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 basically develop essentially you develop your own solicitation and bid. And so that that's definitely possible and encouraged. We got a lot of questions. I'm trying to. I can I can address this. Uh, have from Rose Olivas at UCNR Small Farms. Hi, Rose. Um, have you addressed competition among farmers for this program to sell their food? Could there be possibility that a farmer cannot be accepted due to competition? So there's there that's a pretty layered, nuanced question, and I think is really important. Um, at this stage, we're especially with so initially we had forty million dollars for the state, forty two million dollars for the state, and then they added a second round of funding and extended it. And so now for this particular program, we're expecting around $60 million to go through. And so we're uh, trying to balance not over planning with farmers to the extent that they're reliant on the program and that they can, that this can fit within their existing diversity of a portfolio, but also that they're able to meet the demand and that we honestly are, are more concerned that we'll, we might have to open up the eligibility more farther down the road and are trying to get the word out to prepare farmers in the meantime, um, but aren't trying. It's, it's, it's a pretty big scale as, you know, um, both the producer side and folks who support farmers and buyers all, all know. It's a pretty big scale to do really in-depth planning for production. Um, so we're trying to, we're trying to strike a, a middle ground. And if, if I didn't answer your question, please feel free to follow up and, and ask anything clarifying. Oh, cool. Um, and I see a question from Courtney in the chat. Do farms receive any compensation from the program if they serve in an aggregator role for their farming communities? So yes, aggregators um, who we're calling vendors um, get an overhead fee um, that's eight and a half dollars, eight fifty if it's a CSA style box. Um, and if it's not a CSA style box, the vendor will just incorporate their overhead fee into the cost of the food um, that is being purchased. Um, and we came up with these prices through having run programs like this for the last few years and seeing what's been valuable um, and viable for farms to participate and aggregators. Um, and yeah, in terms of the competition, like like Ben said, we are it's a lot of funding and we're trying to make as many contracts as there's demand for um, to get as many folks involved as possible. Um, we just know that starting out, there might just be more competition on the front end. Um, and so that's where the grading criteria comes through. Um, but our goal is that a group can't get a simultaneous two contracts at once until everyone in the region who is interested in applying has has applied. So it seems like there will might be competition up front, um, but then over time. Really interesting question, Robin, of who are our real champions at the USDA? Is it a fragile coalition? Um, yeah, long term, we're trying to really in collecting the strong data, we're trying and being part of a group or a, a big project where there's an implementer in every state. We want to make 
a case that this funding should be permanent in the farm bill, which it's not right now. This is stimulus funding. Um, so there's a really strong con uh, network of LFPA implementers around the country who are sort of working to push the policy. I will say the USDA have been great so far in just uh, advocating for the program and rebuilding it, um, but it's going to be an uphill battle to make the political case um, that this should be permanently funded. But through 2025, we have a pretty strong runway um, in our hope in California. And what we're, we're seeing, honestly, is that we have what we think is to be one of the, the more progressive models. Um, and if we can prove here with the largest pot of funding that this project is successful, um, we will bring that to USDA where we have, um, you know, we have their ear um, to, to make that case. And, you know, more broadly, our hope is that this investment, what we can prove is that with you know, subsidized food in a way um, for food relief or hunger relief, we can actually come up with new models to create opportunities for any of the aggregators or vendors to sell into more traditional market channels. So can we prove that an investment of this kind actually um, catalyzes uh, into traditional sales and strengthens the food system? That's like our high level uh, vision and strategy that we think will point towards sustainability. And I'd like to add to, to what Andy just said, that if you do end up participating in this program, we want to hear your stories, what your experience is, the challenges, everything. So this is not only so that we can tell those stories to USDA and the corresponding authorities that need to hear those stories to make this program, expand on this program, I would, I would like to say, uh, but also so that we can, learn, since we, this is a first of its kind at this level, at this size, so that we can learn from those gaps that you find uh, obstacles or good or, or basically we can learn from your experience so that we can improve the, pro the program that's what i'm trying to say now i also want to answer a question that lewis rollins just wrote that if we're, you're encouraging education how are you educating farmers on how to get themselves involved moving towards mutual aid so there's i think this is a complex question uh, so my first answer is that CAF has a specific program called the Farm to Market Program, which helps farmers that either to find new market channels or to aggregate to, so that they can enter new market channels, larger market channels. So that's one of the answers in which we can provide technical assistance to any farmer or group of farmers that wants to aggregate. Additionally, we consider uh, aggregators in this specific program, uh, you would be considered as an aggregator if, let's say, your farm represents a bunch of farms. So you apply as one farm, but you represent several other farms. That counts as an informal aggregator, and that type of aggregation is also applicable uh, to this program. So maybe you don't have a formal food hub, for example, but you and, and, and 10 other farms want to work together so that you have a better chance of participating in this program. That can be done as well. <laughs> it's very flexible in that way. We want to represent or as many farmer realities as we can with this program and try to really have an impact on, uh, on small farmers and the food insecure communities. I just, I just put a contact list survey into the um, chat as well. And that's for our, our information distribution. And so I, I just saw another question and this also applies to Lewis's question as well. Um, but we're, so we're, I mean, all of the group has farmer relationships and we'll be sending out outreach to farmers. So far it's been starting with existing farmer aggregators that we know in their networks and existing food hubs while we just get out the basics of, of listening sessions on, on how this could, how this will work well for everybody. But we have the, you know, the CAF listserv and outreach to our teams with all of a team of, five or six people reaching out to different partner orgs and different farmers throughout the state. Um, and not to mention fresh approaches and um, the Association of Food Banks farmer network. But then we also, um, will if you join this distribution list, we'll be able to put call outs and you can also email info at farmstogether.org if you wanna reach out to us and see if we can match with some you with somebody in your area. And so like two examples of how that could work. As we approve vendors, we'll post those and you can see who the approved vendors are and you can reach out to them to try to sell through them if you'd like. If you reach out to us and say, hey, I'm in this area, do you know of any aggregators in this area? We can also support you with that. 
if you if you say, hey, I'm in this area and I'd like to aggregate with farms around me, we to some extent we can support you with that too, and and at least do an initial intake and and try to um, give you know offer guidance in whatever way we have applicable experience. Um, so there's a lot of different. It's you know we're we're real people and we're here to serve you, and um, we don't want this to be to be difficult to navigate. So if you're as those questions realize, please reach out to us. I think that's that's what we're here for to respond to. Um, thanks, Ben. And I don't know if you see in the chat, but the permissions need to be changed on the uh, distribution list survey um, so that people can fill it up. <laughs> Great. I will. I will fix that right now. I don't know how to do that. Um, we are coming right up to time. Does anyone have any last questions? Actually, how do we show the poll thing? Kind of not do it. Yeah. Well, Ben changes the links. Yep. I'm actually gonna. All right, good spread. Um, a lot of Sac Valley folks. Not that many SoCal folks. Interesting. Just so everyone knows, so because the funding is going to be distributed by population centers, Southern California is going to have the largest pot of the funding. So. Shame on them for not being here. Okay, there are some people in the South. Got some Bakerfield. All right, y'all are here. Y'all are here. Um, let's see what else. We got a lot of farmers, got a lot of nonprofits, one food hub, a lot of others. I'm curious what other is. But cool. All right, let's just make sure. is let's just double check does this i think i might have had the wrong link actually tell me if this link works just put that in there okay so since we have people from all over the state uh, and before we we finish we need to like i've seen a lot of people asking for wilkin to say something so wilkin out i just want to mention something and then the floor is yours um <laughs> So after the small firm conference, I want to invite everybody to, to the regional gatherings. So we're having several throughout the state. There'll be a central coast. There'll be over in Sacramento. So uh, I think in Southern California as well, we have one even over at Humboldt County. So do check in the CAFS website, the location of those or in sketch, the location of those regional gatherings. And hopefully we'll see you there. And Wilkin, the floor is yours to say something. Okay, uh, yeah, thanks for, for calling to hear from me. Um, prior to coming to this anti-hunger organization, that's the California Association of Food Banks, I worked uh, as the supply chain director for the Alameda County Community Food Bank in Oakland, California. And my last year there, there was a real initiative to really start looking at the diversity, equity, and inclusion policy of the food bank as a whole. And one of the things we looked at right away was how can we impact our food sourcing to start reflecting having a more diverse uh, vendor base. And this allowed me to work uh, initially with an organization that had connections to BIPOC farmers. Uh, we set a modest goal initially of trying to sink in half a million dollars uh, with BIPOC farmers. And at the end of the year, we actually sunk in $1.2 million. So uh, it was great because uh, you know we, we were able to tell the stories of how the impact of this change in strategy, um, you know, raised the profile of these farmers and really spread the word uh, with other hunger organizations. We got grants from a lot of companies as well as Feeding America to continue this work, and uh, I see LFPA as being an extension of this movement. Now, what's I know the grant runs out in 2025, but I'm hoping that the relations and learnings uh, belt in these next two years is really gonna set foundation for the preservation of a local food system that involves organizations like food banks and uh, farmers and growers such as yourselves. Um, the only caveat is that the food banks themselves have to also realize the importance of this movement like my old food bank did and really carve out some budget to continuing this 
uh, strategy of, of working in state. So I am excited for the program. Uh, hope to see it starting in about three months and um, there's a lot of excitement. So thank you. Well, thank um, you, everybody. Got a great closing question from Anna um, with Kath um, about how, what's a simple overview of getting involved? Um, right now, the best thing to do is click that link um, to join the distribution list um, where we'll be sharing information. Because we haven't launched yet officially, um, we still don't have that many details public, um, but we will be making that available in the coming months. So the best way, the best thing you can do is just follow along. Um, as we launch the website, as we um, put out materials um, for applying. And just in case it isn't wasn't super clear, um, if if you asked a question in the chat in the Q and A, and no one answered to it verbally, that no one answered it verbally, uh, that means that we answered it in the Q and A. So go back to the Q and A, and you can see those responses. All right. Well, thanks everybody for coming to the workshop and uh, let's thank our presenters. And we hope to see everyone at uh, another workshop. We've still got two more days jam packed full of workshops at the California Small Farm Conference. So thanks for attending and we will see you guys soon. Thanks all.